Hello, everyone, and thank you for tuning in to another episode of This is Revolution in conjunction with The Real News Network. If you are enjoying what we are doing here on The Real News and you want to see more of it, the best thing to do is definitely hit like, definitely hit subscribe. Don't forget to hit the bell so you are alerted every time The Real News drops these videos. Also, if you like what Pascal and I do, please go on over to This Is Revolution Podcast or .com or YouTube.com backslash This Is Revolution Podcast and subscribe to our channel as we do interviews like this Tuesday through Thursday, 6 p.m. Pacific time and Saturday morning for me, 9 a.m. Pacific time. That being said, let me bring in my co-host, my homie, my dog, he is the man of the Mau Mau Hour, journalist, writer for Newsweek. He is the Pascal Robert. Peace and greetings to the audience. Peace and greetings to the Real News Network. Peace and greetings, Jason Miles. What's up, man? I'm, you know what? I wore a tie for the occasion. And it is the only tie that I have. It's okay. I can't see it because your microphone is covering it. Damn it. I spent all that time making sure that this was tied perfectly. And you can't even see it. Well, at some point during the show, you won't notice it because I can take myself off screen. I'm going to make that microphone adjustment so you guys can see the work that got it, that went into not just the tie, but fitting into the shirt. Good to know. We have uh, a very good guest today that we're talking to. We hit you guys first with Adolph Reed. Then we came back with Chris Hedges. Then we had the Giannis Varoufakis show. And today, who do we have, Pascal? We have Pro Professor Joy James. Yes, we do. In the 80s, the creation of the Black Welfare Queen was used as a scare tactic, a tool to gut public goods programs that benefited the poor and working class. Bill Clinton, who was sold to the American people as a savior from 12 years of neoliberal rule in the form of Ronald Reagan and George Bush, Clinton doubled down on the rights assault against public goods governance with the omnibus crime bill in 94 and poverty increasing welfare reform in 1996. What we call here at This Is Revolution, the 50 plus year counter revolution against the New Deal and the Great Society programs. How have we gone from the racist images of single mothers of color living fat off the system to black girl magic and a growing black bourgeoisie? Has the Nixonian ideal of black capitalism finally replaced underclass ideology as a tool of containment for the ruling class? We're going to discuss this with Dr. Joy James. Dr. James is a renowned scholar of American political philosophy. Her work analyzes the way race, gender, and class are rendered in American society. Today, in the face of the current Supreme Court nomination of Judge Ketanji Brown Jackson, who was appointed by an administration holding the first black U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris, we will discuss race, gender, and class in the current American context. Please welcome... Dr. Joy James. I received applause twice, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that, that rarely happens, like once is like rare in itself. But, and maybe there's a metaphor here in terms of what we're talking about in terms of the rise of black women uh, through empire. Yeah, the 1980s with Ronald Reagan, right? Mm -hmm. Those, uh, the two term president who would have, um, what, I'm sorry, I wasn't prepared for all this, but there's, I was thinking the two terms of Ronald Reagan, right, comes mm -hmm. after two terms of Richard Nixon, who has incredible racial animus against black people as well. 
right? So Nixon is, you know, what, 68 is the election, you know, 72 should have been 76, but there's the impeachment. You have four years of Jimmy Carter who comes from the South, and it looks like the same with Bill Clinton, like I'm used to being around black people, so mm -hmm. I know how to talk to them and deal with them, et cetera, et cetera, right? But you still have no um, sustained gains where wealth becomes shared among the working class and the poor. But there are these opportunities, right, to enter into government. And I think Nixon would have been one of the first, right, because of his position on um, affirmative action. So the larger context is that you have these movements. You have the civil rights movement. You have the black power movement. You have the feminist movement. You have the anti-war movements, right? That this is galvanizing thousands, tens of thousands of people, not just in the U.S., but also across the globe in order to critique the U.S. as a racist imperial project, right? So that these presidencies, right, that, that come in, that follow this, it's to tamp down that desire for struggle. And also I would argue in some ways they had the capacity to tamp down the skills for struggle. That once you start hiring black people, once black people in white corporations or firms or in the government itself, in the academy, which is where I've worked for the last two, three decades, that once you start to absorb blacks into these structures, then we become part of the infrastructure of the state itself. Hmm. And that project obviously wasn't just a personal pet project of Nixon or of Reagan. Again, a four year little gap here with uh, Jimmy Carter or sure. other presidents that followed, including the disastrous presidency of um, Gerald Ford. George. Or Bush. H.W. Bush, who got us into a bogus war in the Middle East, right? But it's also the product or the project of Barack Obama, who I see as the first black president, but also as the first black imperial president. So the, the question of all these presidencies, right, or this legacy of the executive office is to maintain the state and to allow it to expand and to accrue. Um, we know that for centuries, accumulations have come out of our labor and out of our loss. I think the question that we're going to tangle with today, has that been split into a kind of different gender formations where we no longer have the type of solidarity we used to in the 1960s in terms of identifying an opponent and being willing to move against it? Well, I, I, I want to ask this about what you mentioned about um the the black introduction into government roles um and this is even shown in pop culture of the time i can't remember the name of the movie with diane carroll and james earl jones talking about the, oh um oh that's a very important movie claudine claudine where you know it actually gets into not that deep into the weeds of like you know you can't have a man in in your home and there were people that worked to get the men out of the homes right um and that's part of that story where they're hiding james earl jones like underwear or something like that like in one of the very scenes. moynihan very 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 moynihan-esque but let's remember that these programs are born out of not wanting even women to work when they're rolled out uh in the 30s um that's what a lot of that that was for i can't remember the original name of uh of welfare but it was designed for non-working females and this is you know a an era well, where go ahead yeah it was designed for white women right yes particularly white women who were widows mm -hmm. right? correct so you so the whole yeah. notion of, of the family is a white project and a white supremacist nation i mean if the nation like you know was born out of genocide right and enslavement then part of what it disposes um or tries to kill is the very notion of family cohesion and community cohesion in indigenous and black communities or nations, right? So this is this is where it becomes really complicated for me when I try to see what the fulcrum is like on this seesaw, how do you balance this? The nation really works for white women, 
but to some extent it had to include black women within the category of human to some extent right well, what do you say if when people you, say, i'm sorry i'm sorry sorry go ahead no i'm sorry i didn't mean to cut you off it, uh, well if you were performing the duties of the state mm -hmm. like you can entertain them but as eartha kitt found out you know in the johnson administration mm -hmm. once she came out against the war in vietnam and confronted lady bird you know the first lady johnson's wife i mean According to some scholars, President Lyndon Baines Johnson, who supported civil rights, gave the pin, you know, to King signing Voting Rights, Civil Rights Act, et cetera. Uh, he used the CIA to destroy Eartha Kitt's career. Destroyed her so, career. Like, you're, you're told if you can entertain and sing for us or dance for us or we like that movie or, you know, historically, you know, you nurse our kids literally on your breast, right? If you can reproduce our family integrity, you are tolerable. If you seek agency autonomy for civil rights and human rights, you're a pain in the neck and maybe you should disappear in whatever way. Lose your job, lose your housing, lose your freedom, go to prison, or you know, like Malcolm and Martin, lose your lives, right? Yeah. So I just I just, just want to add to that, you know. Um mm -hmm as as the those original aid packages were being rolled out as the new deal was getting rolled out i think 1935 um divorced women could not get it um uh uh non non-widowed women with children couldn't get it so there definitely was uh caveats on who who could get aid and who who could not get aid but what i wanted to add with with your very very astute point about adding black people into the government apparatus is when these people were part of the system so to speak there was kind of a unified voting block with the people that were part of the system receiving the aid and now the people that have moved up into a new middle class and we definitely see this in the early 70s that are part of the same system so they're kind of voting in unison to keep these programs and you definitely see this in the more major metropolitan northern cities when you look at a place like atlanta when they have their first black mayor in maynard jackson one thing he does is increase the business sector and you turn atlanta you know coca-cola the massive airport which becomes a hub private capital is now hoisting the same black people into the middle class and they're not so aligned with their poor and working class black neighbors um i believe towards the end of the jackson administration we actually see the destruction of a lot of the uh housing the uh what, do you, what would we call it government housing um in atlanta as well so th there's there's an interesting you know, juxtaposition when we talk about like you know including black people into the government apparatus you know trying to <laughs> protect the system if you will and then also when you have private capital and there's right. there's the, the demarcating line almost of class isn't it, isn't it this has become a practical or pragmatic aspect right that mm -hmm. once you're included into an apparatus or a structure then the logic would be that you would protect it. And so once you have black people protecting state accumulations, corporate accumulations, those who are left behind are, are just seen as even more deficient. I mean, this is part of the reason I avoid the language that we've inherited today about, it's not just black girl magic, but black excellence, right? Mm -hmm as if that everybody else is mediocre or substandard, which which is so aligned with the language of white supremacy. Like, how do you know you're excellent? Is because you got the corporate job or you got the degree or, you know, the JD, PhD, whatever, how many Ds, you know, doctorates or whatever is happening here. But the larger picture is, this is a capitalist society that was built on slavery, rape and genocide and that the accumulations always accrue to the top. So if you're ethical 
you would want to tinker with that machinery and not just be seduced by all the, you know, what's the glittery, you know, well, the glittery could be a Tesla back in the day, might've been a Cadillac or something. I don't know. But I think one of the questions we have to think about is what is our collective position on something that looks like a mixed economy or socialist economy? And so how do we stop these buyouts that turn those who remain in certain zip codes as disposable or vulnerable to poisoned water? Think of Flint, Michigan, poisoned air, you know, disproportionate exposure to police violence and civilian violence. Well, it's, you know, it's really what I really appreciate in, is in your discourse is that it's very much in alignment with the narrative that we try to expose on our show is that like any other people, black people have class internal stratifications and conflicts like everyone else. And unfortunately, because of the way in which society portrays black life as a unified underclass phenomenon, the stratification of class, which has been a reality of black life going back to the days of free people of color societies, is completely obscured to the majority of not only uh, Americans overall, but also to many black, black folk in America as well, who are not necessarily connected to those within these communities who are more proximate to capitalist power or the gatekeepers or the ventri racial ventriloquists, if you will. So the narrative that you are very eloquently exposing is very much in line with what we try to do in terms of trying to complicate the notion of collective community. We, in, in other words, and you may disagree with this and I will respect you if you do, is that it's very important for us to complicate the notion that black people work as a unified community because our argument is that that renders black people to a politics of containment. In other words, black politics is contained and used as a pawn of the ruling class because the ruling class will choose the racial ventriloquist who speaks for the masses, undemocratically chosen, while the masses have no say in the agenda and they're moved like a piece on a chessboard. So black politics becomes a politics of containment in the rendering of collective community in that fashion. And it's, it's, it's something that we on our show try to challenge effectively. I, I like to make the argument that there are multiple black communities, not just mm -hmm. one black community, if you will. I now like that, to hear that. Now that's great. And, and, and it's making me thinking there are multiple black feminisms in the plural, mm -hmm. not just one form of black feminism. And that should also be stated for abolitionism plural, not just one form of abolitionism, right? But it, yeah, I totally, agree with your analysis. And then when you're speaking, I'm starting to think about how we were warned about this, right? When Malcolm was talking about the big house in the field, right? So the big house today could be, you know, Deutsche Bank, Bank of America, you know, um, working for the State Department in its foreign um, projects, are working for the DOJ, you know? So, there was a moment in the 1990s, I think it's 1993 or 94, when Kathleen Cleaver was the first woman to sit on the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party. And this is Oakland before, you know, things went one way and, you know, Cleaver left and, and the party fractionated in part because of the violence of the COINTELPRO, but also the contradictions and the violence, which based on my assessment, largely started coming or originated from Oakland, right? But Cleaver says in this interview, and it's for me, it's very curious because I believe she's being interviewed by Henry Louis Gates, who's obviously in the big house called mm -hmm. Harvard. Um, so Cleaver is saying that the Panthers had to pretend they were a unified front in terms of as black people, because that had to be projected out. So they thought as a political strategy, but they clearly knew that the black middle class, the petty bourgeoisie, the bourgeoisie um, blacks with means and money and ambition, that they were going to be hostile to the Black Panther Party as a revolutionary or proto-revolutionary formation. But it wasn't even an internal conflict, right? 
but also they would be hostile to, you know, supporting liberation movements in the so-called third world or global south. Mm -hmm. So there's always been a sector of the black communities, as you've said, in plural, that have been trained or prone or see it as an opportunistic, you know, in port portfolio, whatever, um, to work for the state and to work for the corporation. And it doesn't seem to have been really an impacted people that working in these um, zones would be an extension of anti-Black violence, but this time with Black faces. I've got to plug in my... Oh, no. Pascal, do you want to add on to that? No, I think that I, I, I appreciate that assessment. And one of the things that we definitely see is with the with the rise of this incorporation is that the more that becomes this incorporation into the apparatus of the ruling class by what we call the black political class over time, the more and more the importance of symbolic representation becomes the focus of what is deemed black political aspiration and the less redistributive policy of trying to change the material condition of poor and working class black people becomes the focus so much to the point where I'm reading actually a book on uh, black political history where cynically the Democratic Party recognizes in the 1980s that they literally can offer black people the symbolic representation of appointments and political candidates instead of actual policy that changes the material condition of poor and working class black people. And what we find is the more we, the further and further we get away from the civil rights movement, the easier we find that black communities, plural, are intoxicated with that, with that politics of symbolism and less willing to demand any kind of truly redistributive materialist agenda for working class and poor black folk who are the majority of black folk would you would you add to that that um there's something to be said about the civil rights movement movement really pivoting away from uh getting the communists and socialists out of the movement and really having the movement be about inclusion well you know it's a very to, uh, it's a, you know, it's a very good uh, addendum to the point because if we read uh, Preston Smith's rate, uh, good racial uh, about racial democracy uh, in Chicago, and he talks about how part of the problem of the civil rights movement is that the limitations of the Cold War deny the capacity of the uh, leaders of the civil rights movement to really put forth a materialist pro-working class agenda. And as a consequence, they focus on what he uses the term as is racial democracy or racial inclusion. And what his argument is, is that whenever there's a policy or politics of black politics that is premised on racial democracy, it basically becomes a wealth transfer to the black petite bourgeois or the black professional managerial class or the black elite because there's no risk redistributive agenda in racial democracy because racial democracy can mean that we literally have a ruling class that is 14% black, 60% white and 18% Latino. And now that's democracy and everyone else can be basically be either a slave or a serf or a tenant farmer. And that doesn't make a difference because as long as they're proportionally represented, proportionally represented in every level. And what he's arguing is that what we was needed was social democracy, which was a redistributive materialist agenda that would have changed the actual material condition of poor and working class black people's lives instead of just simply asking for racial inclusion. And even Dr. King and Bayard, Bayard Rustin and A. Philip Randolph in 1965, they realized that the, not, the, the traditional civil rights movement is not gonna do what is necessary to change the condition of working class black people's lives. And that's why they asked for the freedom budget for all in 1965, which the Vietnam War denies, denies the ability to really be funded. 
Well, uh, Dr. James is back. She was having some uh, technical difficulties. Should we start hitting her with the real questions now? I know. We just going light. <laughs> okay. And sorry, my phone is overheating or something. So I'm, I'm just I'm back online here. So you don't have my. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So what are the, what are the real? It. I thought what you just said was pretty real, but okay. What's more real than that? Oh, no, okay. those were the warm-up questions. <laughs> so, Professor James, in preparation for this show, we acquired your book, Transcending the Talented Tenth, Race Leaders in American Intellectualism. One of the, as we said earlier, one of the persistent themes that we have on our show is the way class stratification amongst Blacks facilitates a Black political class that works as a racial ventriloquist for the majority of working class and poor Blacks in exchange for their economic patronage and enrichment from the ruling class, largely to the detriment of the black masses. Where do you see the contemporary black academic and ac black, black academics in general in this particular hierarchy, and particularly with the rise of the Obama and the post-Obama black political class? Are black academics more likely to challenge this class hierarchy or reify it? Okay, thank you for that. Um... Howard University professors, I believe, are on strike right now. No. Yeah. And that is about the conditions under which they labor, which means teach, right? Um, but the students had gone on strike quite a while before, I think months before. It may have been as um, late as last year. And that was about the conditions under which they lived, right? mold, less lack of security, I mean, just substandard housing, right? And so the faculty are paid by Howard. The students are through tuition or grant money or contributing funds to Howard, but Howard also is an expression of both state and corporation. If we look at where we are today, I would say we're just in a slog. We're in, we're we're in a marsh. I mean, I could keep throwing things out like a mud <laughs> or something like that. I mean, it's there's no solid, stable ground, in my opinion, in the academy to speak with the integrity, the honesty, and just the 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 brilliance of of the people who were intellectuals in the open communities, meaning like again, plural, you know, Georgia, you know, Mississippi, where my mom's from, Texas, where, you know, my father's um, people are from, et cetera, et cetera. Because the academy is now an imposition upon intellectualism that is tied to freedom. That means it, its function is not to march or articulate even a clear agenda or strategy for curtailing an imperial racist project, also known as US democracy. And there's been so much money flooded into the academy in terms of how the administrative strata, which, you know, how many provosts do you need? How many, you know, et cetera, et cetera, um, have turned into a state or private corporation. And for those of us who've come in like decades ago, and I will include myself in it, we've been able to secure certain types of monetary packages, right, with health benefits. But the academy is also, even without a union, they're union busting, right? It's about extraction from the students, their ideas, their energy, their tuition, and extraction from faculty, even the ones who are, you know, conservative and not really committed to social justice. So I, th I think if I were going to kind of wrap this up in what I'm trying to say, don't look to academics for answers. I would, I wouldn't even, you know, read their books. You know, you have leisure time, you can afford them. Hopefully, libraries have some. But we're not trained. Even if that were the case, like in the 1960s, you know, or something, when there was so-called thing as race people, and that was more legible, we're not trained to serve Black communities. Hmm. We're trained to treat knowledge as a commodity 
and then put it on the shelf and hopefully get enough buyers so that it looks like our brand has, you know, some content behind it. So, and even I would argue, and this is like, this will get me in trouble, whatever. I would argue that even some of the writing that is about these movements, right? The writing for me, sometimes it's not imaginative. It doesn't take risk and it doesn't speak with the voice of the people who created the movements. There, when I think about Erica Garner, for instance, transitioning at 27, leaving a seven-year-old and a four-month-old behind. And I didn't even, I wasn't even aware. I was leave, living, you know, in, in Harlem and stuff. So I thought, you know, when I can, I'll, you know, make a donation or go to a march or something like that. But I didn't understand her vulnerability to, you know, not having sufficient support or better doctors or better care or more alliances. And I would say the academics could have been much more helpful. I'm not saying we could have stopped the death, but we could have been much more helpful in these movements. But what we tend to do is to write about them, package them, that content in between two book covers and have um, book tours. And I'm not saying that's bad. That is a form of knowledge. It's, but it, that, that is that is the reality. And it's a, a very kind of stark one when you think about it, because I think one of the better books, if we just take, let's just take the Eric Gardner case, mm -hmm. was not even by an academic. I think Matt Taibbi one, wrote one of the better books on the, on the Eric Gardner situation, really uh, bringing uh, uh, broken windows policing to light for a lot of people. But but all that being said, I mean, sadly, too, we live in a world where a lot of this stuff is just easily digestible. And how many people are actually even reading the books? Okay, so then what's our function now? I mean, as academics, I mean, how do you see academic? You can ask me. I mean, I work there. But really, you're the, quote, consumers. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to be a producer, but I don't mm -hmm. own the company, right? So I'm you're really a worker. Company. Mm -hmm. Did you ever did you ever read Barbara Ehrenreich's work in the in the eighties and late eighties and nineties about the professional managerial class yes. or Catherine Lou's newer work on it? Yes. Virtual orders. I guess I mean, go ahead. No, I think I think I think the the academy is definitely a part of the PMC and produce more people that go into the professional managerial class. Yeah, but I wonder to what extent, I understand like we're a factory, we're churning out people with degrees who then become managers, right? I'm wondering to what extent we would own up that there's something much more nefarious about that. that this well, mm -hmm. Universities are not created to be counter-hegemonic institutions. Right. I mean, the purpose of the university is to reify a ruling class that maintains the status quo of a functioning capitalist empire, which is the United States, or the or Western imperialism, or West, the West overall. You know, no one is going, no, universities are not designed to build revolutionaries. They're right. designed to create people to solve problems so that you don't have a revolution. But okay, so, but when you get to this moment after the movements, right, where people want black studies, women's studies, LGBTQ studies, Chicano studies, ethnic studies, yeah, what it all looks like that this is, or at least the right wing says it is, an assault on the academy, like corruption of its quote purity, which is just its white supremacy, it's ethos, silly. right? But why, do, yeah, but why do we believe, or do we believe that because now we're writing about movements or writing about feminism or writing about, you know, fill in whatever the blank is, you know, all the good fights. Why do believe why do we believe that this knowledge from academic sites is trustworthy? It's a very, very, very good provocation you put forth. And I have a have a better provocation than I've asked before, is that there was a time in which radical politics within black spaces demanded things like black studies or Africana studies or uh, African-American history departments. Can we ev evaluate the efficacy of that demand if the quality of material life of Black people is degrading 
as the existence of these institutions proliferate, is it not fair to say that perhaps the utility of these institutions is counterindicative to the quality of life of Black people over time, and they're serving a purpose other than actually helping solve the problems of Black people? So they're like a Trojan horse. I, I, I think that, that, that there's logic to that argument. I mean, commodifying education to me is, is also extremely frustrating. Like the fact that I just can't learn something to learn it, it's kind of a waste of time. Like I have to spend my money learning something to be some sort of cog in the in the machine of capitalism. That's kind of the reality for a lot of people. And now we live in a world where we are the commodity. And we're very well aware of this. You know, People know when they go Google search something on their phone, they know that they're going to get hit with a whole bunch of ads. Right. Either they ignore them or they succumb to them. So what, but no one seems to mind that they are the commodity. They, you can turn that commodity now uh, your, yourself. You, know, you can make some money off of it. I mean, we have the, the rise of hustle culture. And what you guys talking about the ineff ineffectual nature of the academy, kind of one and the same. Can we pose an alternative to it? Can we build an alternative to it? Can we create like during COVID, right? When they were having those pods, I mean, the you know wealthy people were having pods that were like thousands of dollars to buy in, right? It's like a poker mm -hmm. game. But other people, like in Brooklyn, they were just, you know, I know you were nephew, you know, got your nieces, whatever. It's just you start understanding that education cannot belong to the state and it cannot belong to the corporation. And that, you know, as I said before, for me, there's only two types of universities, at least the upper tiers, right? They're the state universities like UT Austin or, you know, um, University of California, Berkeley, whatever. And then there are the privates, the Ivies like Harvard, Yale, Princeton, Stanford, et cetera, et cetera. And then the, you know, the private colleges, whatever, which, you know, which is also where I teach. So how could we create an alternative zone of intellectualism and critical thinking, knowing that the academy, as you both rightly pointed out, was never designed for that. It was designed for elites. And even as we said in, you know, the Talented 10th, Spellman is named after a Rockefeller, Laura Spellman, and Morehouse is named after Henry Morehouse, who is a white missionary philanthropist. I mean, even the creation of these schools were to create a managerial elite. That's why Absolutely. it's only the tenth. It's one tenth of y'all. And Du Bois signed on to it in 1903 because he popularized the concept in the souls of black folks. But then by the time the state was hunting him with McCarthyism and other stuff, he said, he said, you can't trust this sector. Just as Kathleen Cleaver said in 1990s, Malcolm said in 1960s, this sector is engineered for betrayal. But it still has credibility because it has all the shiny diplomas and degrees. So how do we change the very meaning of education and wrestle it back from state and corporation? That's a very we have to start, uh, first and foremost, do we, we have to start thinking collectively and not so individually. Well, I mean, I, I think I, I want to go to a, a basic question is that a step I think is even more uh, basic than that is that we have to come to the reality that most people in America, black or otherwise, really don't have counter hegemonic thinking. Mm -mm. In other words, most people don't organically see the system as a problem. They see the fact that they can't participate in the system as the problem, but they don't see the system as the problem. Well, because we live in a country, and, and I want to get you and uh, Pascal, I want to get you and Dr. James' take on this. Would you say that we live in a country that is literally based off hero narratives that one good person can get into this system, which isn't so much corrupt as it just has bad actors? We see the judicial system that way all the time, right? That it's not a flawed system as much as it is. There's just bad people inside. There's bad judges, there's bad prosecutors, but the system itself was built on honor. The, the, so 
I mean, I mean, I think breaking through that line of thinking is is the really, really hard part because it's kind of baked into the idea of American exceptionalism. Absolutely, particularly, and you, Jason, you said something very, very important. When it comes to the law, you know, I studied law, I practiced law. That's where my 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 academic training is in. Is that the the one of the most effective ways the charade of American exceptionalism is perpetuated is in the reverence of American law and the American legal system. And when you challenge the e efficacy of the American legal system, what you will get from people trained in it is that there's no other system better in the world. Where else in the world do you have the protection of the rights that you have in the United States? And my response to that is that America creates the illusion of those rights because America has the luxury of extraction to create the comfort that denies the capacity of other people in the world to have that justice because it siphons off so much of the global resources to create this level of diluted comfort amongst its citizens. And it's no actual argument to say, just because you're eating spam instead of dog food, that you have the best meal in town. So the comparative mediocrity of justice in the Western world doesn't make America great. It just means America is the best at masking its mediocrity because everyone else is so bad. Yeah, I would add to that. It's the mediocrity is, is just driven by predatory behavior. It's like, I mean, how many people can you kill? I can't, nobody can keep count. It's too much, right? I mean, even it's both on the international and the national. And you're right, you get this weird patriotism that's tied to consumerism. Is if you get to shop, it must be a working democracy, right? And what it's doing is you're saying extracting from other countries, other regions, other continents, right? I mean, the Ukraine thing is is horrific, but that's not the first war we've ever seen. And when I think of NATO, I'm like, oh yeah, I teach Amilcar Cabral, you know, return to the source. And who assassinated him? Well, Portugal and the CIA and NATO, because Portugal was in NATO. So Portugal is the first country to get into African enslavement in the 1400s. And it's the last one that wants to get out in the 1970s. And so I wonder if we would remember our losses, if that would stop this fetish for this democracy, which is really incredibly violent. But as long as that violence doesn't personally touch us, we seem like we can be compatible with it. And you see that with the right wing push against things like critical race theory, right? The idea that this law theory is being taught in public schools and it's being deduced to, well, slavery is not going to get taught anymore. We're not really going to say bad things about, about white people and, and damn it, we're not even going to talk about the Civil War reconstruction anymore. That's all quote unquote critical race theory. Um, it, yeah, I wonder. Ahead, Pascal, sorry, Pascal. Uh -huh. No, I mean, I, I mean, listen, the forces of reaction, my, I, you know, I, I've come to a position largely as a product of not only doing this show, but really just kind of reading a lot of American political history is that um, the notion that America is a center left country is a canard, is, is a charade. America is a reactionary right wing country mm -hmm. and it always has been. The problem, and this, I see this as a significant problem of all factions of America, left, right, so on and so forth. People take the anomaly of the period between 1944 and 1971, i.e. the New Deal, the Bretton Woods period, the post-World War II, the, the, the massive expansion of American largesse, the quality of middle life for white men, because it was really white men who had the jobs, the he leave it to beaver, you know, you know, Ozzy inherited narrative of the American family, the standards of what normative patriarchy is, the standards of what normal family is. All of these things were an exception to the normal way American capitalism functioned since its, 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 its beginning. 
largely to save capitalism from radicals who wanted something more revolutionary, which brought forth the New Deal. But because that period of time, particularly 1944 to say 1971, is perpetuated through media as the example of America is great, let's make America great again. No one's talking about, you know, the Lower East Side in 1913 when they're saying let's make America great again. When they're saying let's make America great again, they're talking about 1954 or 1952, Ozzie and Harriet. Yeah, yeah, but you know what? Donna Reed comes to mind too, right? Um, but there, we were always the problem. We were always that, like, you know, America's great, and then it's like something's going on with Black people, right? Because you, you were talking about the 50s, and what comes to mind, Pascal, when you were speaking, was what Mamie uh, Till did with the child corpse. Like, an oh, open casket funeral, for me, is a declaration of war against a state. It's in, And then the photos go out everywhere around the globe. And so I think in some ways, in relationship to us, and I'm not sure... I, I just feel like we catch, catch the hell, the brunt. It's not just from the cops. I mean, from everything, right? This is an mm -hmm. anti-Black um, nation and zone. But it seems to me that they're always looking for Black people to prop up, to prove that this is not as lethal, as violent. I mean, 1963, you like you put a bomb in the women's bathroom of the church to blow up you know, Spike Lee did the documentary for little girls, right? Right yeah. after Martin King does the, I have a, dr you know, dream. And then it's like, and the Klan is like, it's going to be a nightmare, right? But we, I still believe in us as Black people as being the wild card. And I think that's how the state sees us as well, which is why you want a Black president, a new, another Black Supreme Court. You want a Black cop. You want a Black mayor. You want to, you just want that, here's one of y'all to police y'all moment and to show that we're not white supremacists to the core. Well, I, I, I really want to respond to that. It's a very, you know, we, Jason and I have an ongoing debate. Mm -hmm. And we, we, and I want to be very, very honest with you. We have a problem with the trope that exists on the left that black people are the vanguard of the revolution. I'll tell you why. Because it denies the fact that, number one, what makes black people revolutionary is not the melanin in the skin. It's the material condition under which black people are forced to live in a capitalist society in America and in the world that renders them to surplus everywhere, stemming from chattel. And number two, when you position Black people as the vanguard of revolution, it denies the fact that large segments of institutional mechanisms in Black societies, plural, are premised on reactionary politics, ideology, and worldviews that are sexist, misogynistic, uh, uh, anti-poor, pro-capitalist, abusive, whether they be schools, universities, churches, membership societies, mm -hmm. you name them. And that, can Black people be revolutionary? Absolutely. Do Black people have revolutionary capacity? Absolutely. But it's not because of the melanin in their skin. It's because they are ground to dust disproportionately in capitalism because capitalism requires an N-word and capitalism requires an N-word so that, unfortunately, white poor people don't believe that they can be one. I, you know, I don't disagree with that, but I want to, I want to trouble it or stir it in the pot, right? Mm -hmm. We, there's nothing inherently, you're right, about our color per se, except for how people respond to it, right? Meaning police forces, vigilantes, um, white supremacists, so on and so forth. And I don't believe that all Black people would mobilize in a freedom movement because that's not how it works. It never quite worked that way. It's not working that way now and it won't work that way in the future. And I, you're right. I mean, I appreciate your saying, like, don't project some romanticism like we have a unique role and we were anointed for whatever. But I do believe that there's something about 
what we've accumulated in our consciousness, in our memory, that we remember, like whatever your stories, your grandparents told you about Mississippi, whatever, like we understand lineage and inheritance. And we also understand that the future could just shift and go either way. Not for like people who are Colin Powell, right? I mean, he can work for Reagan and all those people and, you know, still be happy about, you know, being an admiral, sorry, not an admiral, a general, and then um, ending up, you know, secretary of state or at the UN, et cetera, et cetera. However, his true, true uh, career trajectory goes after coming out of the Bronx. But there's still other people, right, who are political prisoners today. Other people who are young people who are just organizing, walking away from the degree and from the academy and the corporation. And disproportionately, I feel the material conditions, but also the, the psychological and the emotional conditions under which we live. Like, you know, eight minutes to choke somebody out while he's crying for his mother. That has an impact and that forms a consciousness. It, it, it does, but let's be honest about that. Okay. That ain't affecting everybody the same way. And this is where I take a little bit, I don't want to say offense, but it's, it hits me a little in, in a personal place mm -hmm. because I grew up in, are you familiar with the Bay Area? I lived in Oakland for a short period. I was born in Oakland and I grew up in Richmond, California. Okay. So you, you're probably familiar mildly even with those areas mm -hmm. and um i've lived a bit of an economically precarious life and i don't have felonies but i've spent a long time driving without a license because i couldn't afford like car insurance and my license i got suspended or i remember there was a time when i couldn't pay a ticket mm -hmm. and i was driving without a license all told, I think I drove seven years without a license. If I get pulled over by the cops, I'm going to get effed with. I might even get my butt kicked. Because I don't live in a good area. I'm driving a crappy car and I'm driving it without a license. They might want to tune me up just because they can. You know, the prisons are filled with people that committed serious felonies. Didn't get tuned up on the way in. Cops know who to mess with and who not to mess with. And... I think what happens is, and this is where I get kind of a little upset is there becomes this, they're getting all of us thing. And it's like, now everybody is going to face police violence the same way. This is, I want to, this is a statistical fact, uh, uh, Professor James, and I want to, to off of what Jason is saying mm -hmm. at the exact time, the rate of mass incarceration increases post civil rights which starts in the 60s, by the way, before the end of the movement, the mass incarceration increases for black males and eventually females without a high school diploma starts to increase precipitously. The amount of carcerality or imprisonment of black males and eventually females with any level of college education drops like a rock. So what, what happens is that the mass incarceration is not exclusively an issue of blackness. It's an issue of black race and class. Because as uh, James Foreman ex uh, uh, eloquently demonstrates in his books, Locking Up Our Own, the likelihood of a college educated black male having an interface adversely with a police officer compared to a black male with no high school diploma, is like a 10 to one even in terms of the wealth of the zip code you live in, over $100,000 $100, of per capita income compared to those under 30, the chances of even having a police interaction skewed. So one of the problems with the way in which we talk about we, one of the things that I don't even like is even talking about we when we talk about black people. I don't want to say we. I would say they are poor black people and working class people who are being ground to dust and they're class enemies. Okay, this is really helpful because now I understand better or will try to articulate better. 
I understand. Uh, we're not, I'm not trying. I'm not trying to be antagonistic. If if I'm coming off that no, way. No, no, no. Oh, please. I have a 13 year old. I know what antagonism looks like. <laughs> but I don't want. Um, I don't want to come off that way. No, I just no, kinda... no, no. This is really helpful because um, you're both right, and I've got to figure out like how my language can can be more clear. Because look, when you're talking, I'm thinking, oh yeah, when Henry Louis Gates was arrested, you know, the in shot of it, he's on a beer summit on the White House lawn with Obama and Joe Biden in the white cop. And he traces the white cop's genealogy. It's like, oh, we might be relative. I'm like, this makes absolutely no sense to me. Like, mm -hmm. this is what happens to everybody else. And it's like, oh yeah, that was Harvard. Because mm -hmm. Kind of like Derek Bell says, like when he gets stopped when he's driving, he's got a white judge's name. You know, he's driving through the South and Derek Bell is the architect of critical race theory, but the radical form of critical race theory. And he just talks about, calling out the name of the white judge so the white cop knows that he belongs to a white person. There are segments, yes, of, and you're right, black communities in the plural who don't care about the working class, who don't care about the poor, who don't care about environmental devastation or anything else. Um, that's not us. But then I'm trying to figure out what is the language or should there not be us? Should it just be radical blacks? And then what is radical? I, mean, I, I don't. I don't. We we had a show the other day, uh, Doctor James, on our on our This Is Revolution channel that mm -hmm. sadly YouTube did pull down, uh, where we spoke with a man that was on the cutting edge of house music. If you're familiar with house music, that really comes out during the mid '80s and, and '90s, mm -hmm. and. In our discussion, we're trying to, you know, we're going back in the roots of house music, which is, of course, disco. And he had made an interesting point about culturally disco was supposed to be um, the antithesis of funk in a way. Oh, that would make sense. If funk is their music, right? Uh huh. It's it's ghetto. Part it's not refined. Mm -hmm. When you think of a band sh called like Chic and Nile Rodgers. Mm -hmm. Um. They are the proggy funk. They are the refined funk people, right? This is for an elevated class of individual here. Mm -hmm. And you can see it in the, in the way the shows looked, how, how different they were. So I, I think it's, it is just kind of baked in. We, we keep talking about like how, and that's why I'm, I'm bringing up these kind of contradictions because we have to understand how baked in to even popular culture, there is an otherizing. There's good black people, and then there's always the bad. And there's this disassociation um, in that documentary on Deutsche World about the burgeoning black bourgeoisie. It starts off with, I believe he's the richest black man in America, right, Pascal? That's no, first not Z, but one of one of, I'm sorry, one of the richest black men in America, that real estate magnate. And he's got Aston Martins and multi-million dollar condos. And he says, I don't live like those rappers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because he's, it would have been like a version, like I guess among whites or Europeans, the version of old money aristocracy yeah. Um, in comparison to crass new money, which is boorish and rough and has no culture. So, yeah, I mean, their money becomes their culture. Their students go to private elite schools. Um, they don't socialize with the riffraff, which, you know, probably people on this call. So <laughs> but what is our radical project in the face of that? And I guess that's what I'm saying about in terms of the betrayal because when I talk to black doctoral students and, you know, some of them, they don't come out of means, they come out of the Bronx, like, you know, they grew up with Cardi B or something, right? They're in the underground, their families were in the under, underground economies. And they keep saying that when I talk about a captive material instead of about black feminism, because I'm trying to think of caretaking as a non-gendered function, right? Um, they they want to know if I'm willing to engage in the zones of betrayal. And then they, one of them actually say we should off the captive maternals who betray us. And I'm like, no, because that could include me. I have contradictions too. So how do you see the politics, right? Now that you've differentiated between the posh and the polish and they can be invited to the White House or get a medal or, you know, whatever. And our, some of our luminaries, like 
you know, Toni Morrison, Presidential Medal from Obama, some other kind of medal from um, Clinton, right? From Bill Clinton. But how do you see us or do you see us forming political alliances that will not be subverted by the rich and powerful? I think that you have to have something that we have never had in this country, which is a working class black politics. So now you sound like Adolf. Is that like from Adolf Reed too? Are you all in line or what are we talking about? <laughs> I think there were some people who would say they would call us fans of the Adolf Reed tradition. Just maybe, I, just a little bit, maybe. Do, do, have you been following what the young man, uh, Chris Smalls, has been doing with Amazon? Oh, with the, um, the wait a minute, I've been following the, with the union. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I find him fascinating, and I interviewed him a few years ago when when he was first kind of the story had broke about him. Mm -hmm. And what I found fascinating about Chris was that we had kind of similar stories as far as how we came up and even where we were working. And one thing that people don't really take into consideration, and we we talked about this a little bit on our our show, is a lot of people on the left got very dejected and kind of confused about Bessemer, Alabama not voting to unionize. And one fact that people didn't really take into consideration, I felt people on the left and taking consideration is that job was more money than most of them people had ever made before. Right. I spent time working in the South on oil rigs. Wow. It's a non-union place. The South historically is not a very unionized area. Mm -hmm. And to think that you're going to get cats that a lot of them, this, this is unskilled labor. This is the surplus labor we talk about so much when we love throwing around theory. And surplus labor is getting $19 an hour in a place where $19 an hour can probably buy you, if not a house, at least a nice double wide. And I don't say that with any sort of disrespect. Right. I said as far as like people need shelter and that's affordable shelter. And that's food on the table. That's food on the table. Why would you why would you want to upset that apple cart? I'm not saying it's justified to not vote for worker protections and some sort of labor power. I just think that a lot of us are a little disconnected ideology, ideology ide here <laughs> from the idea that, you know, some of these people in these areas are making more money than they've ever made before. And it's very risky to try to organize around that. The one thing that got Chris radicalized was COVID and people literally dying on the shop floor. Wow. So the he doesn't come out of Marx. If, if the majority of black people are working class and working poor or poor, right. what sense does it make to have a politics that's not rooted in the actual material condition of most black people? When you say the material conditions of most white people, you mean uh, black people, I said black people. Black people, sorry. No, it makes no sense, but but let's let me try to parse this out. Mm -hmm. There's two, you know, because I'm I'm wearing multiple hats here, right? Like I'm like I got the academic hat on, which mm -hmm. feels like I should take it off, but then, you know, that would be dishonest cuz I get paid to wear the <laughs> academic hat. So <laughs> Then there's this other thing, like when was I last like a waitress or, you know, I did those menial jobs at some point too, right? But those, those, those years are way in the past, you know, decades in the past. So from my setting now, my lifestyle, my employment sector, I can read about the disposition or dispossession and disposability, but I'm not on that shop floor. Right. And I can say that during the first wave of COVID in New York City, and I've said before, like I'm in my middle class apartment, but on one side it's multi-million dollar and the other side is NYCHA, public housing. But when the in New York City and they stopped giving you the numbers, when they went from losing 20 people a, a day dying in their apartments, they went from that number to 200 a day. And then they stopped telling you what the numbers were, right? until they could bring them down. The body bags were only coming out on the right side of my apartment where NYCHA was. And that radicalized me, I, but I wasn't gonna be in a body bag, right? 
because I was like, well, I'm like, and this is the the middle class. Like we're the fulcrum on the seesaw. We're just like, we got one foot on either side and we're just going to balance. We don't have, a, you know, we're not multi-million, like we're going to jet out somewhere, but we're also not in public housing and we're not forced to, you know, show up as a nanny or a babysitter or whatever, just to keep food on the table. So what is the role of the people who are balancing between the two zones? They're never going to be millionaires, but they're never going to be poor and unhoused. And well, mm-hmm. as traders, you yeah, are class, you are a scholar of Amilcar Cabral. I think Cabral had the great, great, great formulation: class suicide. Got it. Okay. But but what you know? What's the neutralizing factor in the idea of class suicide? What hustle culture? What culture? Hustle. You're not working hard enough. In other words, if you're if you're a middle class and you're not a millionaire, how come you're not selling Bitcoin? How come you're not driving Uber at night to get those extra hours? Why aren't you doing overtime? You, you mean you don't have your own business? Well, well, you don't even, have even, LLCs? Even beyond the idea of everyone's a millionaire, just the fact that you you being busy, constantly busy, yeah. is like a function of of kind of not so much success, but like every day at work you have to be working over forty hours. If you're not, if you're working 40 hours, you're not working hard enough. Right. So, you know, we're, we're going to, we're going to hit you up all the time. And the moment that you stop and say, um, I need to take my kid somewhere. Mm-hmm. I need to meet. Nope. There'll be someone else to replace you that will work twice as hard. So we, will- you know, and that, and that is very, very prevalent in the, in the PMC culture is and when i say hustle culture i think people just kind of automatically mean oh you mean like bitcoin and those guys no i mean the idea that you have to constantly be working and the moment you're not working you should feel shame right and the new york times picked this up with the supreme court nominee a a woman writer who said like oh she had to balance being a mother and how she's raising her daughter and feeling guilty. It's just like, how do you even make it to this level of a job offer, right? Unless you are putting in more than eight hours a day over decades. But then that is expected if you're to be worthy. And then mm-hmm. worthy of what? It's, you know, I've called this a predatory democracy. So it's it's all around. I mean, unhealthy is an understatement, right? But there's corruption and self-deception that's built in. So how do you disentangle your value from the state's metric? I mean, that's the hard part, right? Go ahead, Pascal, I'm sorry. Class suicide, class traitorism. Got, you've got to, uh, I think it's a matter of, of reorienting. I mean, I, for me, you know, I grew up in a kind of middle-class family in Queens in New York, my, you know, my parents didn't have elite jobs, but my parents also were Haitian immigrants and they came from an upper middle class kind of Haitian elite in Haiti. And they kind of had, you know, middle class jobs. My mother was a nurse. My father was a car mechanic. He owned a couple of repair shops. But because of the time I grew up in New York City, we had a nice kind of middle upper middle class lifestyle. But at the same time, the reality of the protect, precarity of life does not obscure me from the fact that people can be ground to powder, everyone can be ground to powder, and that all of my education does not stop me from possibly literally being on the margins for reasons, health reasons, you know, uh, personal reasons, economic reasons. And at the same time, for me, part of the process of realizing this is spending a lot of time with poor and working class communities of black people who have been ground to dust. You know, I went to college and law school in a very, you know, I was in a black fraternity. So I had black potential PMC career types throughout my teens and twenties and early thirties. And then I joined the community. I basically, I converted to Islam. I became a Muslim and I was dealing the same way I was dealing with those professional managerial class aspiring black men. At 30 years old, my social sphere were black men who had been ground to dust in prison for years. 
who accepted Islam as adults. Mm -hmm. And what I found is that those men had more integrity and character than the career professional managerial type guys that I had known my whole life. And I started to realize that the politics of that first coterie of men has a large role in determining the quality of life in that second coterie of men. Mm -hmm. And that was a radicalizing experience for me. Now, I'm not saying that we should demand that of everyone to, to, to do to, to go through that, but I think that there's got to be a process to indulge in that class suicide or that class traitorism to have people realize, like, listen, this ain't working for most people. Well, I don't think most people understand the statistics, right? There's there's a common statistic you hear people like Richard Wolf, the economist, talk about all the time that people are producing more now than we've ever produced before. You know, working more hours and making less money. I think that's hard for a lot of people to wrap their heads around, especially people that are in the salaried world, because they took that job knowing, like, I'm going to be probably working a lot more, but I'm making six figures. I am part of, and, and I'm I'm working my way up to elite status. And there's a ladder that they can see that includes those hundred hour weeks. The How do you get those people to see that those hundred hour weeks are is it's a sham? I I think in part they already know it. I think it's the people are miserable. And like they can, you know, shop and be entertained. Like how many Netflix series can you watch, right? But if to go back to what Pasquale was saying, if if like the people who are captive find a spirituality an acceptance of themselves that is not dependent upon like running around a hamster wheel, right? And working for a predatory structure, then that opportunity is open to everybody. It's just would be if you're willing to let go of the propaganda or the internalization of, you know, values, right? That are built on a capitalist economy if you're willing to let go of those. And so what would be the incentive? I mean, one would be your misery, two would be your compassion because you see how the world is being devastated. But three, I actually think it would take a certain kind of courage. Yes. Because you're, you're, it's not like people just say, oh, here's the door, have a nice day. I mean, they tend to track and punish. I mean, the point is there's not supposed to be an out. And when you start like creating, you know, these avenues or crevices to get out of, you know, a kind of machinery. It's not like people celebrate that. I mean, the people who are receiving you do, the people who are looking at your back as you're departing, my experience in the academy is that they're gonna wanna destabilize um, and delegitimize you. Because once you turn your back on the edifice, it's kind of like the emperor has no clothes. And that's not a narrative that's you're supposed to be publicizing, right? I totally agree. I'm just trying to be honest about, uh, I don't know, maybe there aren't any contradictions and I'm just letting my head get in the way. But let's go back to Black women. The way yeah. we're trained, right, is to compensate. Like even the leadership is a compensation package in some ways. Like the way I always looked at it, whenever we got a promotion and stuff, it was another form of domestic labor. You were there to clean up somebody's mess. They put you on a grant, you're there to clean up. They want you to build Africana studies. It's because they don't, you know, the institution's like, we're looking a little racist here, come, you know, fix and tape something together. You're never actually in control, even though you're giving, given these positions that look like you have power. But the fact is, no, you have, like you say, you have more labor and more grind. Well, we've been talking for almost an hour and a half, and we do want to close with the final question. Pascal, are you ready to ask that final question? 
Uh, I actually have so many questions that I have. We had so many questions, and, and this conversation has been so I mean, wonderful that we got away. <laughs> I'm pacing around the office, like, what, what do I think? What's going on? <laughs> I have a question based on the judge. Judge Katanji Brown Jackson is currently being nominated to the Supreme Court. Though Judge Brown Jackson has surpassed the rather low bar of having some progressive elements to her judicial record, mm -hmm. there is a certain danger to the way neoliberal identity politics was used to advance her nomination. When asked by her Senate questioners as to what value there was to having diversity on the bench, on the bench she stated, Diversity lends and bolsters public confidence in our system. Can you problematize how that assertion further illustrates the class nature of the Black political project in terms of what the system means for most Black people who are on the margin? Yeah, I would say kind of Obama already problematized it when he said, he wasn't a black, pre you know, he's a president for black people. He's a president for everybody. I mean, for me, it's it's the uh, dictate of absorption that you have to absorb, be absorbed by the state and capital. And then you have to um, perform functions of maintenance for it. I mean, when it's our, I mean, this, you know, this happened to Michelle Obama too, right? She wrote that thesis at Princeton that just was critical a bit of racism in America. And then she spent the next eight years apologizing for it, right? Being like the, the mom of the nation, as if this is like, this is, should be balkanized. That's my position. Like, you know, I would say, let the white supremacists have Idaho, but it belongs to indigenous. So you can't do that. So you still have to fight them. But there's a way in which our desire to belong as if we thought that was an insurance policy, right? There's a way in which we articulate that constantly, that we're safe Black people, that we have no autonomy and we don't even want it, no matter how much the white supremacist underground starts to play around above ground. I think that becomes the moment when we cut our own Achilles heels. And the logic is that you can't expect anything from black officials because they work for the state. And the state has already indicated that it is about accumulation through force. And it is not about distribution of equity or goods or material um, sustenance for, for the people, for the mass, right? And so I've tried to stop being disillusioned every time a black woman assumes some level of power at a corporation within the state. I mean, Condoleezza Rice should have cured everybody of that, right? Decades ago, or even in academia or in one of these movements. I mean, I've like made little, maybe they weren't snarky, but queries about movement millionaires. How do you monetize black suffering and end up like a millionaire? I mean, how does that even, oh, it's like, oh, that's what the state and corporations and whites have been doing for centuries. So of course there's a template. So the way you don't want to romanticize black unity or black community, I will not romanticize black women just mm. because they belong to the democratic party or, you know, they go to church or they're kind or whatever, you know, just put out the descriptors out there. The only subject that has a true autonomous persona and independent thinking would be those people who understand the state must be not only critiqued, but also opposed. And once you take a job within it, then you become the opposition to freedom movements that emanate from the base, whether they're environmental, right? Whether they're about labor, whether they're about the right to be trans or the right to have an abortion. There's like a lot of different issues, you know, that we have to deal with. So, I mean, I really appreciate you both because like if I had a tendency to romanticize black people, you definitely killed it. <laughs> no, no, I just have to go meditate and figure out where I go from here. But, um, yeah, don't that whole thing about black women are going to lead you somewhere. No, just the way you've negated 
the false concept that black people as black people are going to lead you somewhere. No, people who theorize, who will engage in material conditions and material struggle and who will be accountable to the people they say they represent, that becomes a collective leadership that we can contribute to. Awesome. Well, thank you very much, Dr. James, for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, we really appreciate uh, you working with us through all these technical hurdles. <laughs> Uh, thank you guys very much for checking us out on the real news. If you like what you hear, please go to youtube.com backslash. This is revolution podcast. And you can see more interviews, conversations like this that Pascal and I have with the rest of the TIR crew. Yes. There's even more of us. And on that note, thank you. Real news. Thank you, Dr. James. We are out.